evening. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists. Um, pardon me. So first we have, uh, we're delighted to have with us a very prominent designer, a veteran of the science industry, Rudy Christoffel. His career and work has helped shape the lasting nightscape and popular visual conception of Las Vegas. He worked at Federal Science for 15 years, then another 35 years as designer and an art director at Yesco, Young Electric Sign Company. His design education was in the Bay Area, and his background allowed him a unique point of view on design in Las Vegas. The body of his work is a design force in its own right, as well as representing a lasting influence on the generation of designers. Next uh, is Brian Henry, who's a Las Vegas native. He has worked in gaming graphics, creating imagery for popular slot games, and then switched to interior signage in 98. He was a designer of Yesco for 15 years uh, and created designs both for interior signage uh, systems, such as for stations, casinos, and the Cosmopolitan. Um, and he's also well versed in exterior applications, particularly in the area of high resolution LED uh, displays. Uh, last year, he followed his, he formed his own design firm, Brian Henry Design, and continues to work closely with Yesco on large design build displays and specialty lighting projects while also pursuing his interest in motion graphics. Jim Geetson, who is the design director at Yesco. He worked at Federal Science for six years, then transferred to Yesco in 96, where he has been designing and art directing since. He runs a very busy and complex department, overseeing the work of 22 designers. Additionally, he works directly with clients on creative concept development from its earliest <coughs> stages on through to polished execution as sophisticated 3D models, prototypes, and animation. He has been the lead designer on multiple world-class, high-profile, and large-scale technology-driven signage projects. <laughs> Rick Jolene, at the end, is Vice President of Special Projects at Yesco. He started his career in the sign business over 30 years ago in Minneapolis, working for his father's sign company, the Billboard team. He graduated from the American School of Neon, and established his own neon company in Minneapolis. He was a business owner and glass blower until 96, and he sold his company to join the design and construction team at Grand Casinos Incorporated. In 99, he joined Park Place Entertainment in Las Vegas on their development team as a project director. In this capacity, he hired Yesco for several iconic projects, including Valley's uh, Flamingo Paris and the complete renovation of Caesars Palace. He then joined the ESCO sales team in 2004 and currently manages all business development and special projects for ESCO in the Las Vegas office. <laughs> so one brief confession for me, I'm also a ESCO alumna, so we have, I, I do think I have to make that confession. So for, um, uh, I was the design director of the interiors uh, department when that was getting off the ground. I had a wonderful time working there, and, was, and I'm very fortunate to be able to acknowledge that uh, I was a colleague with Jim Beeson and Brian Henry. And Brian will forgive me that I'll go ahead and reveal that I hired you at such a young time <laughs> back then. Um, so uh, also, I just want to take a moment to note that you all should have received a cards for questions. Uh, so if you, uh, as, as the panelists uh, Proceeding, if you have some questions, we'd be delighted to and hope that you will uh, will have some. Um, they'll be collected at a certain point later later in the program. So as you have those questions, if you could go ahead and write them and print clearly, please, um, and also maybe share pens and pencils uh, if, if needed. Um, and then at one at a point later, we'll ask for you to pass them down the aisle to the end, and then they'll be collected. And then you can you can address them either to the entire panel or to particular. Uh, as designer. Uh, all right, so uh, I'll go ahead, and it turns out, um, I'd like to see that uh, we have a really wonderful, rich collection of visual images. Um, so I want to uh, thank 
all of you for preparing those, so I want to uh, plunge right into those. So if you would show us, so hopefully you can see the screens pretty well. Um, so I'll let, I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, I started uh, putting together this imagery, um, and a lot of the, you know, the theme of the panel is past, present, and future. So a lot of the time, a lot of what I draw inspiration from is the Antonine times in the past. Um, so I have several examples of it. And this is uh, all three data. Um, and then this is an example of uh, girls by Mark Otis, who's going to, uh, they want to tease a, uh, another panel in the fall uh, that's going to be specifically about sign painting and We'll get into electric sign. Um, so, you know, these are beautiful signs, and uh, it's rare to be able to see the artist's concepts. And it's interesting to me how much the artist's concepts match the black and white photo. In fact, so much so I had to label it so I could tell the difference. Uh, but this is an airbrush painting, another airbrush painting from the Yesco archives. And I like the little mobster down there. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. um, these are just, like I said, examples of. This was before you were a baby, I assume. <laughs> you, were, you were a young guy just starting out? Okay. And. Uh, oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so I actually have some examples of uh, Rudy's paintings in this, in this presentation. Uh, and we get into the neon spectacular. So obviously this is Vegas, and um, part of the Esco's history is building these um, you know, giant neon spectaculars. Uh, this is actually a model that was in the archives also. And uh, again, it's hard to tell the difference between the model and the actual photograph. Uh, this is famous Vegas Vic, and uh, obviously the conceptual drawing uh, right alongside the, you know, somebody painting it in the shop. So here's, here's Rudy's work. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Long time ago. Yeah. Rudy, those, well, I remember those, that style being called a black card rendering, yeah. right? So that was usually done on you know, some kind of illustration board, sometimes inked it up right in the studio, right? That was a night time to go. Exactly. And some of those renderings might even, uh, well, they might be well, often hand painted with wash and um, accents with colored pencil. Um, and, and chalk. So a piece like that, they're often 24 by 36 in that range, sometimes even larger. Um, and this is, you know, be, before computers, you still needed to show how the thing was going to animate, right? So, so there might be a couple of stages sometimes, that, uh, two renderings that show the beginning stage of the animation and then a later stage. And I've always admired this style and uh, definitely always aspire to to bring out the character of like, the building. Well, that's, I, I've done so many of these renderings that I can't remember. <laughs> you know, uh, talk about speed. Uh, nowadays, you can use a computer and, and, and do the rendering so fast. That's another one. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe it. So what was a typical time span that you would expect? What, what was allowed the... Yeah, I can do this uh, probably concept in one day, in two days of painting it. Mm -hmm. So usually drafting it up, drawing it, took part maybe three quarters of the first day and then rendering yeah. it, started rendering it. And these are then full size for it. And there are really spectacular pieces of artwork, right? So. Yeah nice to see them in person, but they're also painted with 
um, neon colors and that kind of thing. So you have a color range that really doesn't reproduce, just like any artwork, you know, doesn't reproduce so well as best to see in person. That is the original. The original guitar. Hard rock guitar, which they duplicate all over the world now. Right. I always uh, like to think fondly of the like three-story paint booth in the shop at Yesco. Yes. So the requirements, is of course, to uh, never mind the doing a lowrider paint job, you needed to get that fiberglass and sheet metal construction into a, a paint booth that's that enormous and under pressure and so it had to fit the entire hard rock guitar. Uh, this is another example. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I remember this one. <laughs> uh, what's interesting to me is the you know that's an electronic display yeah. in the middle there, and uh, that that's you know that converge. At that time, uh, we have no special. Uh, specialty of that, except when and, and Dixon came over and he took over that part of the sign program much later, about how many years? 1990, maybe, perhaps. Yeah. I remember, you know, when, when I was there too, there was a, a very definitely a hybrid approach where some things would be drawn on the board and rendered by hand, and some things were all on the computer, and often you'd have a situation like this where there might be something hand rendered and then collaged together with the visual output. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but <coughs> I remember a project typical, right? He was, was the Rio big the airport. Yes. You do remember. So I was, I was telling James that uh, I designed the first electronic board on this trip. I was working for Federal Design, and they asked me to do a reader board that's 20 feet high and 100 feet long. You know, and they located between Caesar's Palace and a gas station, put it right there. You know, and people start complaining about it because they they said they were cause traffic accidents. <laughs> and it never happened. But it didn't make it. They were gonna sell uh time advertisement advertisement for this uh, uh, electronic reader board, but they never happened. I think it was, uh, what's the name of people? Domaini, the Domaini, the yeah. <coughs> and after uh, probably about six or a year, people got smart and said, well, let's do a small version of it. Then Sisters Palace uh, st started another sign, and with the electronic reader board. It became very popular. Um, okay. <clears throat> what what Helga's referring to too, uh, when I came to Yesco in 1995, um, there was a, uh, a time when uh, we all hand drew things and then we got into computers and then 3D modeling uh, into AutoCAD and 3D programs. Uh, you kind of had to choose your weapon at that point in time because there was a gray area. Um, you wanted to try to do it all in the computer, but sometimes it would be faster to do half in the computer and half painted gouache, you know. So I think there was some, uh, there were some years there uh, where you, you did a 3D model quickly, you did a, a sketch and, and printed that out. And then you just grab some paint and rendered it in color. So there was, an, there was a time um, for several years where there's a mixture of a lot of different um, uh, medias. And then, and now, as you'll see, as we get into present, um, it's primarily, uh, we, we still start with pencil sketches and markers to get a, a quick concept together, um, but the majority uh, that 80, 90 percent of it is done on the computers, rendered in the computers, and uh, presented as a computer image or an animation. So that uh, I love these old renderings 
we just literally don't have the time to do them anymore. Um, they're done much quicker and revised quicker uh, in the computers. The one event that I, I remember uh, laughingly was uh, in, in typical form, I think we had some a client meeting, you know, it was probably an hour and a half, I don't know, the, the sales exec has a, <laughs> has a important uh, presentation needs to be made and there was no way that, uh, you know, Jim by himself or me by myself could have executed the thing that needed to be done in something like an hour and a half. And uh, so we literally got together in an office and said, all right, you take that part and I'll take this part. We ran off into our separate little studios and um, I did a, you know, a hand rendered section because it had uh, some faces on it and was efficient to do that way. And meanwhile, uh, Jim put it together in AutoCAD and ran out of rendering. And then, you know, minutes before the meeting, I remember using the exacto knife and cutting it out, collaging it together. And, and the project still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, really quick too. I wanted to mention uh, uh, Rudy is a designer on that uh, client too. That he was just saying. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, I included three months reading script. It's big. And uh, it's, 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 it's <laughs> the quintessential you know, examples of what would become very common. That would be the frivolities and, and, and this segues into lots and lots and lots of projects. Present, and we might, for the sake of time, scroll through a lot of these. Uh, yes, goes getting more and more into the sports arenas. Um, this is one that you talk. Um, very successful projects for us. Uh, the link, uh, the new link and quad. Um, uh, the link is an unusual one. Brian and I both worked on that. Uh, we took a lot of these projects start with photo surveys up and down the strip. And the photos told us very, very quickly that they don't have room for a big sign like Caesars across the street. Uh, there's no big footprint that we could use. Uh, this, this is more of a, uh, a response to a sign that hasn't been done in Vegas. And this is what we kind of termed as a beacon. It's a it's a three-sided LED board, basically, and we can turn it into anything we want. It's a, it's a container for media, and um, uh, it, it turned out to be very successful, I think. Um, I'm very pleased with how this turned out. Uh, there's an, another uh, piece there, the Vortex, but uh, that's a nightclub, actually, on the mezzanine level. Uh, but, but this sign kind of broke some of the paradigms that you've seen uh, with the EFIS type signs and the big large poles and such. Uh, so we're, we're trying to break through to uh, what the property needs and certainly bring signs uh, towards our future. I'm interested in the thing as an object. It's an interesting shape and um, you know, it, it, as a sort of a container, um, I think it stands on its own as a, as a very interesting gesture. And uh, it's also unique in the sense that it doesn't have letters at the top. Uh, uh, typically, we would design a sign and uh, it would have the, the casino logo at the top, but in this case, it's down towards the bottom and they're relying on the content to communicate that. And it also gives them the flexibility to turn the sign into you know whatever they want, so they can advertise whoever whoever wants to advertise along that whole corridor. Uh, this is a cool one, GM. GM, <laughs> Detroit. Yeah, that's just a good example of a, um, of a very old, iconic um, set of structures, just five towers, and when GM came back onto the, uh, the market after the, uh, the collapse, uh, they wanted to make a real statement in downtown Detroit. So they, uh, they came to Yesco, and this is a good example of integrating media into the architecture. You saw a little bit of it on the previous slide uh, where we were skinning the underside of that nightclub canopy. Um, this is a very, very uh, big part of our business now where architects are coming to us. They've got ideas of integrating media into the glazing and the curtain walls, and, and um, this is just a good example of kind of capping off the top of the building and then creating some vertical elements and bringing it right down to pedestrian level with uh, 
you know, your typical wayfinding signs, but everything is, is dig digital and uh, dynamic. Yes, and, and this is remarkable as well because I, this is the first totally digital uh, wayfinding sign that I'm aware of. Uh, Aria is really cool. I think we'll talk a lot about it in the design phase <coughs> later. Um, Harmon's another one that I think we'll talk about in the design phase. Cosmopolitan is cool. Uh, Aliante, this is a comprehensive. Totally comprehensive, yeah. We've worked with stations uh, for many, many, many years, and um, and they built a lot of casinos. Um, so we've got the, uh, the we've been given the opportunity to design everything from the outside, the pylons, the monuments, the wayfinding, uh, the venues as you go inside, the, the wayfinding inside, and uh, uh, there's actually a, a, just as much just as many signs inside as there are outside. So uh, it, it gives the opportunity, uh, especially for Yesco, to to capture the uh, the interior and exterior work. They're comprehensive casinos. You can flip through some of these. Uh, all the stations uh, vary a little bit. Yeah. Mark. <laughs> Those were large Caesar's letters up in Windsor, Canada. This, you might have seen the redo of MGM. They just recently have a new LED board. Um, we know portrait seems to work very well on the Vegas Strip. Uh, it's more visible and. Uh, a lot of the signs like Aria you've seen uh, is Cosmo, uh, Link. Many of them are going vertical just because the strip got so crowded uh, you can't see them until you're right on top of them. And the owners want maximum visibility. So this portrait, uh, you'll see more and more here in Vegas. I think, I think there's also um, a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, I think that the portrait format is also a lot more dynamic and meaningful for content. It automatically kind of makes you know, it's just like old paintings. If you want to do a still life, you would do it in a landscape format. If you wanted to paint something a lot more um, energetic, you would you would put it in a portrait format. So I think the same thing holds true for for these displays. That you need to um, model areas of the strip as built to make sightline studies for these signs. Oh, you know, so there's existing. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some pretty comprehensive models, uh, yes. Uh, uh, there's nothing like going out there and just letting someone drive and shooting uh, hundreds of pictures. Uh, it really tells the story. And then we superimpose our designs into the photos and that's how we kind of present. Um, uh, Caesars years ago, uh, obviously we upgraded that sign. Uh, uh, Rick was a part of Caesars back then. And Yeah, that was a, a controversial sign. Uh, um, for those of you that remember the, the real low, famous um, Caesar sign, it had the big, huge, changeable letters, so you'd see Sinatra on the sign. Um, it sat just in front of the fountains, and uh, there were a lot of uh, a lot of very interesting meetings regarding not only taking that sign down, but uh, relocating the new sign to the other side of the driveway. Um, at the time, I was a customer of Yesco and uh, worked uh, closely with uh, Jim Beatson to develop that, that, that sign. And it um, looks like it's already uh, getting to the point where that's becoming a, an old icon. So it's, uh, it's interesting how fast things are moving. At the time, that LED display was one of the largest and most high-tech displays in Las Vegas. In a very short amount of time, it's been dwarfed by the recent installations. Another cool one. Yeah, I had fun with that one, Harris. Uh, I think it's really good to see, you know, the conceptual renderings and, you know, that style, that flavor, that classic flavor, I think is still there. Mm -hmm. Probably a little difficult to see, um, but on the left there, you'll see the dark images. Those are screenshots from a 3D model. <coughs> so many of these uh, more contemporary presentations will be modeled in uh, 3D application, fully uh, rendered and from various points of view and often frequently done as a, as a video, right? So there might be a flyby or fly around. There could be a dust falling in tonight um, with all of the lighting animated accordingly. Um, I remember projects with 
significant vehicles driving by in the rendering. So they get to be, of course, these are very high budget items. So um, the design process and the visualization process is, can be very elaborate um, and certainly uh, as elaborate as, as any 3D that you can think of, Hollywood included. It's interesting that you mentioned that. This is the first and one of only a few signs that I've um, superimposed into actual live action video. We, we uh, went and shot video and then uh, there was a software called Match Mover and I was able to superimpose that 3D model into the, into the video. It was such a pain. But it was, and the customer really didn't care until the sign was up and they were like, it looks just like it looks just like it. Yeah, it's like, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> New York, New, York, uh, New York, New York, 222 feet tall. Um, it, uh, it's, uh, it's a landmark now. Um, uh, New York, New York, as you know, is building another arena behind them. Um, I heard from Bobby Baldwin that he loves this sign. We're not going to touch it. We're not going to move it. So uh, we're glad about that. The portico, yeah. Mm -hmm. Casino del Sol is another good example of that. Uh, and there is a, an example of us taking on the building signage, the archway, the wayfinding, uh, and going inside the parking garage, the, uh, uh, the wayfinding inside, and the venue signage. Uh, it's something that you have a handle on with the uh, style of the, of the casino, and we try to bring that throughout you know, the entire property. Uh, Green Valley Ranch uh, is, has a facelift coming that's being replaced with an LED. Yeah, they just lit up the, uh, the new LED on the Green Valley Ranch uh, sign today for the first time we're testing it. And in about a week, uh, that sign will look very different than it looks like today or in that picture. Mm -hmm. Kind of related to the throughout the building treatment, the exterior, you know, basically leading people from the street to parking lot to the interior of the building, throughout the interior of the building. Um, I think, you know, it might be one's thought that sign design is designing the object that's going to be fabricated and installed, but in many cases, the design part of it, the analysis, is also about where to place them, how large should it be at that particular location, what degree of legibility, what's the distance it needs to be legible from, where is the traffic flow such that we need to catch these people, let's say they're coming out of the movie theater, so where do we want them to be aware or where do we want them to go? And one of the things that's somewhat distinct about perhaps uh, designing interior wayfinding um, for casinos is a bit different than say if you were designing that for an airport, <laughs> where there's a certain degree of uh, deliberate Confusion. I have been helping <laughs> in, uh, in meeting with the slot director and uh, having uh, when I was working as a consultant and uh, showing a plan for locations that I suggested as the person doing the wayfinding. He said, looked it over, said, eh, that looks all right, Helka, that's all right. And then he said, take this out, take that one out, and that goes away. Um, be because those were location signs near the pit, and uh, the idea was not to get people directed elsewhere, but rather to, to have them linger and be confused and hopefully stay. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, that's not, I mean, perhaps that, you know, I've, I've heard some people characterize that as sort of urban Vegas lore, but I can say that that really is true. So, designing wayfinding system for a casino has some unique well, uh, issues, and then also the gaming arena versus the exterior sign. It's a really tremendous range of expertise um, for any designer that needs to kind of join all of those areas together. So, um, you know, it's pretty remarkable the way Yesco has things set up, uh, Rick was describing, um, that the, 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 part, the designers are kind of working together and cross-pollinate and um, can work each other's areas. And then at the same time, there's some separate art direction as well on certain projects in order to address some of those specific requirements. Yeah, if you come into our design department on any given day, 
we could have one designer designing a, a small little restroom sign with a little symbol of a man and woman on it. And right next to that person, you could have, you know, a, a 200 foot pylon sign that's, you know, millions of dollars being designed. And then you come in the next day and it's, it's flipped. And the person that was designing the restroom sign is now designing this beautiful archway for a resort in Colorado. And the person that was uh, finishing up the pylon sign is designing a restroom sign. It's amazing. I included this one because uh, it's an interesting kind of past and present uh, study. This uh, Coke billboard on the right is a really famous landmark in San Francisco. And uh, previously it was neon and incandescent light bulbs. And they replaced it with LEDs and, um, and the programming is, it matches identically the LED and, and uh, incandescent light sign and animation, but it's you know, many, many times more energy efficient. And um, it's just, you would know, you would know unless you worked on the project or read the press release about how it's more dirty than it used to be. City Hall's wind signs, amazing. Um, to me, it's really uh, um, kind of the perfect synergy of the physical design of the object along with the content design. So, you know, one of the things that in looking at this, um, you know, brief sequence, so, and, and what we see happening here in Vegas as well, appears to me to be, you know, very much more influenced with integrating the signage, the display, with the architecture. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to ask about would be if you have seen a change in the role of the designer. Um, with respect to, you know, I think perhaps uh, if Rudy were to describe it, you you would be uh, the designer would kind of separately get the information about the property, but then when you designed the pylon, it was its own contained and complete design thought. There was a time. There was a time, a long time ago. You remember when. Uh, a salesman would approach a client, and the client would like to have their sign made out of pizza. Can you believe that now? See, the outbreak of the computer art, Jim is kind of responsible. This has very direct meanings to the people that visit this place. It's very direct. It's just Wayne's place. It's very simple, but it appeals to people. Thinking about uh, Rudy's comment, which, um, so for instance, a sign would have a distinct and separate theme, let's say. So is that correct? So, so it would be saying that um, uh, the sign itself was a standalone display that ha would have its own aesthetic, that didn't need to, you know, it should relate to the building, but it was the showpiece. Yeah, yeah. So that's the concern of most, I work a lot with architects. In the old days, uh, you had to have permission from the architect to uh, design something that would go very well with building design. You know, when I first came to the Vegas, the mentality was quite different. The, the Western style of how they partner was very dominant. I tried, I tried to change that, but I had no computer to change that, so I, <laughs> so I had to to do it uh, by, by hand, designing by hand. Uh, it took a while, I, I designed a few signs that it's kind of uh, a modern flair to it. The one that I designed was the Emerald, the Gold Course sign of the Dunes, the Gold Course sign, which is uh, a little bit different than the concept of the holiday partner, you know, cowboy mentality. I have nothing against that. That's fine. That's what made those Vegas fans. Okay. Uh, I tried. I tried to put some modernization in some design. I did, but it didn't quite work. The people were not used to what I was trying to do. 
Uh, I graduated from uh, an advanced course in, in design you know, in the Bay Area, uh, but it didn't quite work in Las Vegas. It, it, not until, until Jim <laughs> changed the concept. So I kind of want to take that a little bit and, and turn that to, uh, over to Rick, just the, the sense of um, that the, my, my supposition is that in these kinds of projects, they're going to be much more uh, directed by the architect or in, obviously in collaboration with the, with the architect. So maybe you could just characterize a little bit. That, that seems to be an evolution in how these kind of large scale, um, high profile projects happen. Is that true? Could you? Yeah, that is true. The, um, I'll use an example of, of you know, the present where really, really stunning architecture can act as a sign in itself. And uh, when City Center, Aria opened, there was no signage. There was a, a very beautiful kind of sculptural sign on the, on the freeway, but that was it. Um, everyone agreed that they had uh, a number of you know, beautiful buildings on their property, and everyone knew that that was City Center. However, what was missed was the fact that they had, you know, millions and millions of dollars in venues that they had developed on the inside, including a, you know, a spectacular Cirque du Soleil show, and they had no way of advertising it. And, and what uh, was amazing to us is they were actually putting stickers on the side of this beautiful architecture to advertise their Cirque du Soleil show. So uh, once they came to the realization that you know we needed to, to market to these millions of people that are going up and down Las Vegas Boulevard, we then started collaborating with their architectural group and their team to develop the, the signs that you see out there today. Um, in the modern day, we, we spend a lot of time working with architects, and we have to be very careful that we're not competing with the architecture in a lot of cases. So uh, this group is, is very talented. They can create you know spectacular displays, uh, but now as we move into this real kind of sleep contemporary era that Rudy is talking about, um, it's very important that we're um, mindful of the architecture and we get buy-in from the architectural team that uh, has created it. What I, I find really interesting is the convergence or the blurry line between what's a sign and what's a building and, and uh, cladding the, the building with signage or, or you know, um, and Really, I look back to the golden era when Rudy was working, when that was a thing, you know, you could actually, they, they, there was a building already there, and they, they were fine with it. They wanted the sign to really bring people to, to the facility. And um, I can think of only a handful of modern examples, uh, but I can think of dozens and dozens, I mean, all of it down Fremont Street, uh, you know, those, those great, great signs. Yeah, I think the, uh, I think the, uh, the Link Project is an example of the sign designers coming back and really having a big influence on the architecture and the look of the building. If you go back in time, the, the buildings were very basic vanilla boxes and they would come to um, the talented sign designers and have them create the whole theme and the, the, the facades. You saw some amazing images that uh, really created back at, um, maybe in the 80s, 70s, but even going back beyond that. Um, and then we went, moved into the era of just, you know, uh, highly themed resorts, you know, it was Paris, you were in France, you were in Italy, and the signs kind of went away. Uh, but now we're kind of going back to the original days where the, uh, the, the media and the signage is becoming a very big part of the architecture. Almost to the point where, um, you know, I could ask you what is the jargon that you use in the design department in the shop? Are, are these signs like, almost like media architecture? Media texture is actually a, a term that we've heard. Uh, it's been several years now, but uh, it's used quite a bit. Is is that how you refer to those projects amongst yourselves? No, we still call them signs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> They'll always be signs. But that's what I suspected. No. Here. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of concept drawings that uh, I'm responsible for, and Jim's responsible for. Um, it was one of the things that you asked for. Some of the signs that we drew that maybe didn't get built, or they did get built, 
and also, you know, what's that process? What's the process of iteration? Where does it start? And then how does it get refined through, uh, you know, the customer's needs and budget and, uh, you know, scale? Um, so there's a, several studies in here of scientific and others that Okay. That's great. Why don't you go ahead and run us through this? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, this is a sketch request that I got. Um, and basically, you can see it was really rough. This is from the salesperson. Um, it was a refurbish of, uh, I think it's a 25 foot tall sign in Reno. And um, basically, it turned into, you know, it's just really run down and looked really horrible. So, the direction I really got was be creative and they want something contemporary. And uh, we, I also received a series of uh, architectural elevations. Um, from there, I. Uh, Drew up some science. So the idea is, you know, kind of modern, uh, green um, kind of themes. So um, this is, you know, a study. Uh, this is another concept. Mm -hmm. So these are really quick iterations. Yeah, no, but I mean, keep, keep those running through okay. for us. I, I think it's pretty amusing yeah. that first uh, frame you showed us where the design direction, love that. <laughs> Very <laughs> creative. Yeah, and it was the most cowboy that was telling me. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's well, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was timely and it was useful at the time. You know, your son might decide to put everything in the kitchen sink and they love it. You know, what are you going to do? I have no computer. <laughs> um, and then the design got refined. They actually chose one of my. Uh, one of the black and white options on the last page they decided they really liked, so I developed that one further. So what happened yeah. now is the, um, the salespeople come in, in the past, they would come to someone like Rudy and say, yeah. do, do a painting for me and, and theme this casino and create the sign. He would do this beautiful rendering and, and hand it off to the salesperson and they would go back and you know, do their thing. Now they come in to Brian and Jim and they say, okay, I need 17 options for the sign, and I'm going to lay them all out on the table and pick one. And that's what the computer has done to, uh, to our business. I was going to, one of the questions I had intended to ask was, what about the relationship with sales? You know, that, that and it actually sounds like it's rather similar to, uh, you know, if, 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 do the sale, do you find that you need to participate in the conversations with the client in order to help translate your work? Versus, say, what you just described, which is, let me lay out all these things, pick one, um, which seems like um, very exhausting for the artist and very easy. <laughs> so sorry if there's any uh, sales execs out there. Right? Well, we, we've, uh, we found to be most uh, successful when we bring the creative minds into the, uh, the meeting. Um, there's a lot that's lost in translation. That you may travel across the country and have a meeting with an architectural team and take a bunch of notes and then bring it back and try to, you know, translate it to the team. But there's a lot of body language, there's a lot of passion that goes into the, to, to what was, you know, told. And uh, the notes don't, uh, don't spell it out. So when you bring the designers in, they can experience that. Uh, we find that the finished um, presentation is just far greater. This is, this is another story uh, that uh, bothers me a lot because, uh, Qualification is very important in design design. Salesmen must, well, not putting salesmen down, because they have different, they're usually business people, they're accountants, they're, uh, you know, graduate of some other. Uh, <laughs> but there were signs, there were, there were sales sign that, that, in, that involves a lot of creativity in it, and they, and they have to, to to come up with something that will sell, mostly. They're, they're, they're concerned mostly with sales. And uh, what happened was, uh, most of the designers, I think you agree with me, that you have to practically educate the salespeople who are selling design. And you tell them what you are trying to do for the client. Uh, sometimes they get the idea and sometimes they don't, you know. And what happened was, uh, for example, I worked on a project uh, for two weeks 
for Jay Sarno. I don't know, he's one of the big guns in the tow business in Las Vegas. And uh, we made the appointment to see him in the architect's office. Okay. And I was ready to present the project. But the salesman insisted that he will do the presentation because he knows everything. Uh, <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> and, and, you know, so we went over there and we didn't show the project to Mr. Sarno for a while. He said he wants to wait for his girlfriend's approval. With the girlfriend, it's funny. <laughs> like and approve, maybe maybe he'll accept it. <laughs> and the salesman said, <laughs> finally the, girl, the, the lady came over and the salesman would present, you know, took the cover and asked the client, Mr. Sano and the girlfriend, how do you like it? I said, my God, I worked two weeks for this project. If they said, no, I don't like it, I have to start over again two weeks. So this is the, correct, the, the problem I had for a while with, with new salesmen. Okay? So <laughs> under the current situation, with a much more collaborative approach, you're going to be working very closely with the architects and consultants, and then, of course, the most effective salespeople are also ones that are collaborators. They are equally, you know, very innovative and um, knowledgeable. Um, so all, all of that team kind of approach. I mean, and that, I think that's a, another, um, perhaps, in contemporary signage, I don't know if that's true, but I'm wondering if, you see that as a shift into a more fully collaborative process to execute something as complex as this media texture, or uh, you know, versus a sort of singular designer working for two weeks at a board. Yeah, we um, you know we have a group we call the special projects team, and, and really it's it's a group of people that have independent um, specialties, and we have a designer. We may have two designers. We have a construction person. We have a um, uh, you know financial person. And as a group, we develop the entire presentation um, based on meeting the schedule, meeting the expectation uh, financially of the uh, uh, of our client. And then you know at the end of the day, it still needs to be beautiful and dynamic. So the the collaboration today is what we find to be the most effect effective way to create some of these beautiful displays that you see. I think, I think also, to, to kind of expand on that, as a designer, I feel like I have the responsibility to, this thing's going to be out in the world, it's going to be out for years. I feel a definite responsibility to, you know, try to make something that's beautiful, something that kind of adds to, um, you know, adds to the experience, not, not something that takes away or that's ugly. So, yeah, definitely, um, I'm just going to take a moment here then to um, ask, because we definitely want to have, have some of your questions and get an opportunity for the panelists to respond to as many as we can. Um, if you would go ahead and send any question cards that you've written out, um, out to the ends uh, of your aisles um, so that we can start getting them uh, up here. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to ask Brian to go ahead and run through more of the images. Okay. Um, so this is the Ogden sign, it's pretty cool, it's right around the corner from here. Um, this is the design process that we went through for it. Um, the owner took over uh, the building and they wanted something that looked like it had always been there, but it was modern and appropriate for a residence, not a casino. Um, so this is the first iteration. Um, and this is the final. Uh, this is another cool sign that didn't get built. Uh, customer wanted something iconic, again, something that looked like maybe it had always existed, something that was new, and also something that was new and totally appropriate for the new uh, purpose for the forum. Uh, 
Uh, some of these pro properties uh, lend themselves to a, uh, sorry, different uh, types of techniques. Uh, 2D sketches, uh, flats, we call them. And then we would download the Google property and actually do sketch up right on that property so we could uh, take different views of that, uh, some of those concepts. And those are done pretty quickly in SketchUp. Uh, it's a great little program. Um, you can put geometry down very quickly and uh, get an approval on something that could take you several hours as opposed to several days. And um, you know, with email uh, traffic back and forth, um, the process is sped up quickly uh, from concept to a finished idea. Uh, and then the, the magic question, how much does it cost? So we're right into estimating. Uh, they know how much surface area we can calculate uh, a lot of quantities of price and, and, and such. So um, what I was going to tailgate on some of the things that were said, <clears throat> we've been come pretty much sign architects. If they didn't call us sign designers, uh, we may now be called sign architects because uh, there was a time when they said uh, they developed the entire property. Oh yeah, we forgot to call the sign company, let's get them in. And you'd have a theme or a property to design for um, uh, pretty much under duress. Now we're being called upon uh, early in the construction stages where the hotel is still being configured. Uh, we're taking their CAD plans, uh, their RESA plans. Uh, we're looking at all their plans for the interior design. Uh, so we work with them now. Uh, I think there's been respect in the community uh, with sign designers that we are now a part of their architectural team and they bring us in as early as possible because they know then there's more collaboration going on and they end up kind of getting to an end result uh, that's more cohesive to the property. Uh, then uh, if they do pick one, uh, finished renderings are, are done. Uh, 3D Studio, 3D Max, do you have any students here? We have students, I have students in uh, 3D Max, 3D Studio, SketchUp, AutoCAD. Those are some of the things that would help you be an all-around designer. Uh, we still sketch. We never lost that ability. Uh, computers just are another tool in our belt, and uh, we use them, uh, but there's nothing like, uh, I've been very fortunate to sit with Steve Wynn and develop uh, some ideas, some of his ideas, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I told him, well, I'd have to get back with you and, and do some sketches, and maybe we can you know, uh, come to terms with some of this, and he said, how about now? And I said, okay. So I rolled out the tracing paper and I really just started tracing and, and drawing uh, what I thought would be a cool sign um, for the one in Macau. Uh, his Macau property is a sister identical to the one here in Las Vegas. Um, I literally drew it on his drafting, on his uh, conference table, uh, having lunch with him. So uh, some of those things come about, but it was literally a sketch. And not till we went into back to the shop, I did some three D renderings, some cooler imagery, uh, and that's how that evolves. So I uh, have a great deal of uh, some wonderful, excellent questions, and lots of them. So um, I don't think, given our time, that we'll be able to address them all. But I'm going to suggest this: that I will. Um, compose them as a set of emails, and then we'll all, as a group, do our best to answer them, and then um, perhaps that can uh, go back out um, in some form um, to, to you guys, so we'll see if that, that's a possibility. But I've grouped a, a few questions together that seem to kind of overlap, so I'm going to, I've got three questions here I'm going to read out um, that seem to relate. Uh, so one question is, what role will Neon play in the future of signage? Neon Spectaculars, a related question, animated neon, currently relevant or simply nostalgic? And is LED signage the end of neon? How many projects uh, still involve neon? <laughs> <laughs> right. Who asked the neon question? Yeah. 
Well, I'm a big fan of neon, and actually, you're, we are currently seeing a little renaissance in neon. It's, it's really more for interior um, spaces. Um, interior designers are using it as a, as a way to bring some kind of uh, really interesting nostalgia into the interior space. Um, as far as you know, large-scale, um, iconic Las Vegas neon signs, but significant animation, um, I would love to have a shot to build a sign or design a sign, build a sign um, that's filled with neon. But um, I think we got a ways to go. We got to fill up every square foot of uh, uh, of uh, architecture in Las Vegas with LEDs first before we decide to go back to our our roots. So. I think, I think neon has, is an era, you know, it's not so much a thing anymore, it's like there's this, like this golden era, and yeah, definitely an art form, and I don't know that it was appreciated when it was there, I think only now looking back, it's, you know, it's something that everybody wants to say, but, um, yeah, I think it's, it's up to owners and it's up to fashion, really, I mean, if it comes back in fashion, we'll be doing it. So, also, a thought um, with regard to neon in particular is, in my mind, it also represents uh, an era when there was a, a real kind of uh, high craft. And that's not to say that, obviously, to build any of these LEDs, tremendous um, things, it's incredible, the capable engineers and programmers and fabricators. So that part of signage is as ambitious and, and incredibly impressive as ever, though there is something kind of unique and interesting about, say, the neon shop, which was an apprenticeship. It's, it's uh, you know, so that kind of sense of, I mean, very high skilled, and it's a, a manual of, you know, it's very much a skill in the sense of a kind of, not unlike a medieval guild might have to kind of uh, develop that. So I was, you know, whenever I was walking through the shop, there was always this kind of special aura around the neon um, uh, space, right? So um, that's an interesting aspect, I think, too, about the thinking about signs as objects, as objects of high craft versus fabrications of, you know, great sophistication. Uh, the architects have been using it a lot now for uh, color building for nighttime effect. You've seen some of the buildings that surrounded by neon on the Boulder Highway. There's new buildings that decorated with neon. Uh, so here's a question that I know that uh, you guys will be able to take up very readily. When will Vegas signs be communicating directly with smartphones? <laughs> That's you, Brian. <laughs> Um, it's already happening, but uh, not for the big spectaculars. The big spectaculars are really designed to address a massive audience. Um, but if you go up and down Link, you can definitely see that you know those uh, LCD screens will take a picture of you, and you can enter in your Facebook, and it'll post on your wall for you, or it'll email you that shot. Um, so it is happening. Um, Okay, another question. How often do people confuse sign design with the branding of an, ident of an entity or casino? How do you explain the difference? Sometimes there's not a difference. I mean, sometimes the yeah. sign is the identity. And, yeah, it's you know, possible. Yeah, I mean, we've done logos that wind up being used. So sometimes, most frequently, I guess it depends on how high profile a project is, but there are times when the logo pre-exists the sign design and then the sign, although a significant, um, and it's a thing unto itself as a design object, but it incorporates the, the identity the, in the sense of the, the logo is incorporated into the design. Um, in other occasions, uh, the, the concern with the sign, the building itself is so great that the sign designers have the first graph of the logo, and then it retroactively kind of becomes a logo for property. So that, that can happen, though I think less frequently, especially now. Right. There were, I think, you know, earlier, right, that was much more frequently. Placed. Right. And it's in the name and sometimes the description. When Cosmopolitan folks came to us and said, you know, we have a logo, uh, and it was up to us to decide how to use that logo 
those font styles that we picked, very futuristic, very kind of modern and uh, upscale. Um, it's cohesive, again, throughout the property. You wouldn't want to use a heavy Clarendon font with serifs and so forth. Uh, it's, it's too clean of a property. Uh, they're all going timeless and themeless, as you've seen. They're all glass buildings, uh, certainly city center was. Um, and, uh, and they keep using themeless where they don't want to be in a box where it's uh, uh, you know, Luxor or uh, Excalibur, you know, they're stuck in that theme. So, um, so new and fresh as often word, keywords used. And we, we try to design that signage around that, excuse me. And um, sorry, so I'll do one more here um, for, the, for the panel. Um, what is your favorite sign on the strip? And what sign do you most dislike? <laughs> that might be a little professionally risky. <laughs> my, my favorite sign used to be the Yucca, but it's in the Neo Museum now. It was not on the strip anymore. Uh, for me, Gloria, I guess uh, my uh, my newest uh, on the strip. Um, uh, it's 260 feet. It would have been 333 feet. It would have been the tallest sign in Vegas. Uh, the Hilton sign, LVH sign, is still uh, 290. Um, but at 260, it's a it's a huge sign and a, a, a major accomplishment. Uh, certainly, when I drive the strip, yeah, it's. Uh, it's probably my favorite, my least favorite. I, I really couldn't, I couldn't answer that. Um, it's probably not wise to answer that question. <laughs> what Kirby is saying is no longer there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of modern, I think. Uh, it's a third generation of science hotel. It took it down. If you remember the shape, that was it. It's in the book right there. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, did you want to try to... My favorite sign no longer exists. It's the, uh, it's the old Sands sign uh, with the Rat Pack standing in front of it. Uh, and the old, uh, you know, hand, hand drawn fonts. Um, even the architecture of that sign is uh, phenomenal. Way ahead of its time. Yeah. yeah, you could bring that sign back today and it would be one of the best signs on the strip. Yeah. 